To begin, inshallah ta'ala, we'll begin with the uh, Jewish conception of the Messiah. So the Bani Israel were, giving, were given prophecies of someone to come to deliver them. And most of these prophecies actually were, were given to Hebrew prophets right around the time of the split of the, of the two kingdoms. So when the Assyrians attacked uh, 722 before the Common Era, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of Israel, the Israelites, were divided into north and south. And as the history goes, the ten tribes in the north were, were taken into captivity, or some say they were slaughtered, some say they moved to different countries. Wallahu alam. But around this time, many of the Hebrew prophets were inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give hope to the Bani Israel that some sort of, of messenger, some sort of salvific figure, eschatological figure, would come towards the end of time and that he would gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, and give them victory uh, uh, in, with respect to the uh, military aspect and also victory in the spiritual realm as well. Uh, so, uh, there were many messianic pretenders, um, and uh, the Jews were given descriptions uh, of this Mashiach, as he's called, Ha-Mashiach. Uh, so the word Mashiach in Arabic, it's, it's taken, it's a loan word from the Hebrew Mashiach. Mashiach uh, literally comes from, it comes from Mashiach in Hebrew, which means one who is uh, anointed. Um, so when... Uh, the high priest would uh, anoint or consecrate a prophet into the temple. He would pour oil over his head, uh, thus anointing him, uh, shining him, um, um, glow, making him glow, um, choosing him, something like that, uh, into the priesthood. So when we make, for example, make wudu, we make mascha. So the word mascha comes from the same root as mashach, masaha, to anoint. So the Bani Israel was given these prophecies uh, and they actually knew where he was going to be born. So in the book of Micah in the Old Testament, Micah is a Hebrew prophet from the 5th century. He actually says that, uh, that Bethlehem, small as you are amongst the towns of Judah, there shall arise from you a king who shall shepherd my people Israel. So this is confirmed in our hadith uh, on Laylatul Isra wa Mi'raj. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he when he was taken from uh, Bayt al Haram, he made five stops northward and before he prayed on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Uh, one of the stops was a place called Bayt Lechem, which in Hebrew means the house of meat or the house of bread. He dismounted and he prayed Rakatain, and then he asked Jibril alayhi salam, "Where are we?" And Jibril alayhi salam said, "This is uh, Bethlehem, the city of." the birth of your predecessor, Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. So they knew the city he was going to be born. Now, when Isa alayhi salam came to them, um, one of the major reasons why uh, he was rejected uh, by most of the Bani Israel, um, and we don't really know uh, what was the response of the first generation, because the, uh, the, the historical records are quite sketchy. So uh, when Constantine became Christian, he was the first Christian Roman emperor in 324 of the Common Era. Uh, that's when the Council of Nicaea was held. He probably became Christian a few years earlier, according to Eusebius of Caesarea. Of course, Eusebius is not very trustworthy. He was actually an advocate of fraud and deception to catch fish for Christ and things like that. Uh, but according to the story in uh, the, what's known as the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius, he said that Constantine was fighting his rival on the Milvian Bridge, and then he saw a cross shining through the sun, and he knew that, and it said, by this sign conquer. So he took it as a, uh, as a sign from God, and then he adopted Christianity. But what's interesting is Eusebius doesn't actually say that it was a cross. Uh, it, it was actually the labarum, also known as the Cairo, so the first two letters of the name of Jesus, or the name Christ, uh, in Greek is Kai and Rho. And this is also the, the, the symbol of Cronus, who was the father of Zeus. So this is something that was uh, basically uh, taken on by uh, the early Christians. So basically you take a, a pagan symbol and you sort of Christianize it. And there's many examples of this as well. Um, St. Peter's Basilica is, used to be a holy ground of the pagans. Uh, December 25th, the birthday of Mithras, the sun god, 
and many, many, many other examples. So, so before that time, the first 300 years of Christian history, we really don't know who were the original Christians. Now, we know there were groups called Ebionites. We know there were groups called Nazareans, right? So Ebionites, um, according to historians like Bart Ehrman, they probably represented the, uh, the true message of Isa alayhi salam. They were Syriac-speaking Palestinian Christians who believed in Tawheed. They believed that Isa alayhi salam was the Messiah. They kept the mitzvot, uh, the laws and commandments, the cash root, the kosher, all of that was kept by them. They did not identify themselves as being different than Jews. They said we're, we're a sect of Judaism uh, that has come to believe in Isa alayhi salam as the Messiah. Unfortunately, we don't have any of their writings, right? So the only writings, the only knowledge we have of Ebionites or Nazarenes, because there was a gospel called the Gospel of the Ebionites. There was a gospel called the Gospel of the Nazarenes. There was a gospel called the Gospel of the Hebrews. This is in the Jewish Christian genre of early Christian literature, but we don't have these documents. The reason why we don't have them is because these groups in these, in these scriptures were basically marginalized into oblivion, and many of them were persecuted for their beliefs. So every so often, uh, archaeologists, they go digging in the caves and they find these huge uh, libraries of, of literature, early Christian writings, right, buried in the caves in the sands of Egypt, like in the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945 which actually contain many Gospels uh, of Isa alayhi salam that are ascribed to, to apostles. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, um, was found in 1945, which probably is the closest to what we would say is the original Gospel of Isa alayhi salam. Uh, there's no narrative material in the Gospel of Thomas, though. It's 114 sayings of Christ. 114, of course, is the number of surahs in the Quran. I don't know what that means, but this is kind of a coincidence that's 114 sayings. But what's interesting there is that the author says, this is Thomas the Israelite, the twin. So why is Thomas, I mean, uh, Thomas Toma in Aramaic means the twin. Why is he called the twin? So scholars have theorized that Thomas was actually, uh, he looked very similar to Isa alayhi salam, that he almost looked identical to Isa alayhi salam. And this could explain, Wallahu alam, walakin shubbiha lahum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that uh, it was made to appear so unto the, the enemies of Isa alayhi salam that they had killed Isa alayhi salam. Maybe a lookalike was killed in his place. The Quran doesn't go into such details. Most of our details of the would be crucifixion are, are from Israelite tradition. But anyway, in the Gospel of Thomas, he says in his introduction, Whoever discovers the spiritual meaning behind these words shall not, uh, shall not perish, right? Which is very different than the Gospel of John, right? The Gospel of John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, whoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. Of course, the Pauline uh, doctrine uh, is very different as well, that one must believe in the death and, re and resurrection of Isa, salam, so-called death and resurrection, in order to gain salvation. So Thomas's gospel is very different. Also very interestingly, in Thomas's gospel, uh, which was according to Elaine Pagels, who's at Harvard, she has an interesting theory. She wrote a book called The Secret Gospel of Thomas. And in her book, she claims that the gospel of John was written in response to Thomas's gospel, which places it in the first century or right at the end of the first century. Because in John's gospel, Thomas is, you know, he's the doubting Thomas, right? He doesn't believe until he sees, right? So uh, perhaps this was a polemic against Thomas who had written his gospel because Thomas does not mention anything about a passion narrative. Jesus is not killed in the gospel of Thomas. There's no prophecy of any passion. And this is the crux of Christianity. This is the point of Christianity. This is on the, on the tongue of Paul who says, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain, right? The resurrection is, is the quintessential definition of Christian piety, right? So it's interesting because Paul's message is solidified, faith alone, right? It's all about faith. Your works are as filthy rags, which is seen as antinomian by the Muslims. So there's a group of Muslims called the Murjia who had a similar opinion that as long as you call yourself Muslim, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. And you're entered straight into paradise with no, time, with no punishment in the grave. There's no uh, uh, purification in Jahannam. Your faith isn't affected by what you do or what you don't do. This type of thing, right? So, 
here he says in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, uh, he says, when I am gone, wherever you are after me, go to James the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Right? So Isa alayhi salam here, according to the Gospel of Thomas, very clearly is giving an uh, endorsement for his Khalifa. Right? The Khalifa of Isa alayhi salam is James the Just. Who is James the Just? So James the Just is called Ya'akuv Had Sadiq in Aramaic. So what's interesting about the Laqab, James the Just, Isa alayhi salam calls him the Just. The laqab is the same as the laqab of the successor of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. So Yaqub has had Siddiq. They have the same laqab, right? Which I thought was I don't, again I don't know what that means, but it's just really interesting coincidence, right? So who was James? James was the successor of Isa alayhi salam. But if you read the New Testament, there's one book ascribed to James called the Epistle of James, which is very different in its theology than the rest of the New Testament, right? So we have to understand that very early on we have two distinct strains of Christianity. You have Semitic Christianity and then you have Hellenistic Christianity. Semitic Christianity is the original Christianity of Isa alayhi salam and his uh, disciples, his Hawariyun, his Sahaba. And James was the leader of that church. <coughs> However, that church was completely marginalized by Paul and his adherents, when Paul goes and preaches in the Mediterranean, uh, this religion, this, this strain of Christianity is eventually adopted by Constantine. When Constantine becomes emperor, then it's game over. You have to, you have to follow Constantine's version of Christianity, right? So Cornel West calls this Constantinian Christianity. And there's still people who have the mindset of Constantine. This idea that it's all about empire building, and building uh, uh, an, an imperialist type of mentality and forcing people to believe in our way of life, still very much alive in the world today, very prevalent amongst certain elements of Christianity, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, so the only thing we really know about the original Christians, like the Ebionites, the Nazarenes, uh, is what proto-Orthodox church fathers say about them in their refutations of them. So for example, Justin Martyr, or Irenaeus of Lyon, or Tertullian of Carthage, these are proto-Orthodox Christian fathers. In other words, these are the forerunners of Christian Orthodoxy. So they're writing about these, quote, heretical groups called the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, and they're saying, well, they believe this and that, and this is what we say about them, right? This is our refutations of them. So they'll quote from the Gospel of the Ebionites, but then they'll refute them, but we don't actually have the Gospel of the Ebionites, right? We don't actually have the book that they're refuting. We just have the refutations of those books. So we only have one side of the story, basically, okay? So going back to the Jewish concept of the Messiah is that when Isa alayhi salam came, uh, it seems like the, the, the primary impetus why they rejected his message is because uh, he wasn't immediately a military leader. Right? So the Jewish expectation of the Messiah was one who will come because at the time, what was going on in Palestine, in 63 before the Common Era, the Roman general named Pompey, he comes into Jerusalem and basically sacks the city and makes it into a Roman colony. Right? So you now have these, these Romans or pagans uh, who are just controlling the city, controlling the country. So this was seen as a defilement by the Bani Israel and the Romans once in a while they would have to deal with would-be messiahs coming out of the woodwork. There's been many messianic pretenders. One of the most famous messianic pretenders uh, of recent history was in 1666 of the Common Era. So a few hundred years ago, his name was Shabtai Svi. And this man, it was a European Jew, was a rabbi. He declared himself the messiah in Jerusalem. Uh, he stood on top of a hill or something, possibly the Mount of Olives, I don't know on top of a building, and he said, I am the Messiah. Uh, so then the uh, authorities captured him, they arrested him, the Ottoman authorities, he was taken to the Sultan. And because to claim to be the Messiah uh, is, the, the, the title of Messiah is bound up with politics. If you claim to be the Messiah, you're claiming to be the King of Israel. That means you're 
you're basically claiming some sort of political authority. So this was seen as sedition or treason against the Ottoman Empire. So the Sultan, he said, you have to recant or else you're going to be executed. Because sedition in any society today, right, uh, is, is a capital offense. Even in America, in postmodern America in 2012, if you're guilty of treason against the American government, they'll, they'll take you off, probably torture you first. Although we don't torture in Islam, it's haram. Ta'adib is haram. Um, so no waterboarding. Um, or what does he call it? Advanced interrogation. In, in, advanced interrogation techniques. That's what Cheney said on The Tonight Show. Anyway. Um, so, so he asked this rabbi, Shabtai Sfi, he said, you know, if, if you're the Messiah, then we can't kill you anyway. Because... Obviously, the Jews didn't believe that Isa al -Islam was the Messiah. But if you're the Messiah, according to the Jewish concept, you're untouchable. Because it says in Psalm 91 that the Messiah won't even dash his foot against the stone. He won't even stub his toe. He's untouchable. You come near him, halas, legions of angels will protect him. Right? And this is the Jewish concept of the Messiah, which is very interesting. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So he's, they said to him, if you're the Jewish Messiah, if you're the true Messiah, then you cannot be killed anyway. Uh, uh, and if you're the second coming of the Christian Messiah, or the notion of the Christian Messiah, then that's also a political office, and you have work to do, so we won't be able to kill you anyway. Or you can admit you're lying, and we'll let you go. Just make Tawbah. And he said, I, I admit I'm lying. And he made Tawbah, and he lived amongst, he changed his name to Muhammad something. He didn't need to change his name, but he converted to Islam, and he just lived the rest of his life, and he admitted he was a, you know, he was, he was a messianic pretender. And this has happened many, many times in Jewish history. Even in Galilee, uh, right at the time of the birth of Isa a.s., there was a man named Yehuda the Galilean, Judas the Galilean, who claimed to be the Messiah, and the Romans uh, crucified him. Um, uh, at the time of Isa a.s., there was a man named Bar Abba, or Barabbas. Uh, Bar Abba actually wasn't his real name. His real name was actually Jesus. But most people don't know that. And there's a good reason why people don't know his first name. Because in the Gospel of Matthew, when Pontius Pilate is going to ask the crowd, right? So this is on the, on the day of the Jewish feast. So there was a custom. He wants to show goodwill to the Bani Israel. So he says, I'm going to release one of your prisoners, right? If you're familiar with the Gospel, the Synoptic Gospels. It's also in the Gospel of John. Though. So he says, which, which one should I release to you? Barabbas? Right? Or Jesus, who was called Christ. So the crowd screams, release Barabbas. Right? So then they crucify Jesus. Now, in very early uh, manuscripts of Matthew's Gospel, so if you study textual criticism in the New Testament, very revealing uh, historical study, textual criticism. Like, there's a book called The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. This is one of their books. The Orthodox, Yani Tahrif, of scripture. And this was written by eminent New Testament scholars like Bruce Metzger and Bart Ehrman. Uh, there's another book called Misquoting Jesus, which is written by Bart Ehrman as well, which is um, more of a like a, a, a it's, it's another version of the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, but for the laity. There's another book by Metzger called The Text of the New Testament, Its Transmission, Its Corruption and Restoration. It's corruption. This is something that the scholars admit, right? So one of the variant readings of this story from Matthew, very interesting, and it's based on very reliable Greek manuscripts of Matthew's Gospel called Alexandrian text type. They're the, they're the least corrupted type of New Testament Greek manuscript. Basically, Pilate is saying, who shall I release to you? And he says, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus Christ, right? So basically, it's the same thing. Because Bar Abba in Aramaic means the son of the father, right? So this is a messianic title. So they say that Barabbas was a zealot. He was an insurrectionist. He was part of a group called Sikarai, which means the dagger men. These were, these were Mujahideen of Bani Israel who didn't play around with the Romans, right? It's, there's zero tolerance. So it seems like he was given this title by his followers and was being hailed as the Messiah. So therefore he was given the title Bar Abba the son of the father, which is a messianic title. And his first name was also Yeshua, Jesus. So basically, Pilate is saying, who shall I release to you, Yeshua bar Abba or Yeshua bar Abba? Yeshua bar Abba or Yeshua HaMashiach? It's the same name and the same title. So somehow, so 
possibly they screamed for the wrong Jesus to be crucified, right? And the real Isa salam was saved. This is this is a um, uh, one of the explanations, or a possible theory as to what actually happened to Isa alayhi salam. Wallahu alam. But later manuscripts of Matthew they took the first name of Barabbas out of Matthew's gospel for this very reason that we don't want to be unclear. We don't want to be ambiguous as to who was actually crucified. That Barabbas was the one freed and Isa alayhi salam was crucified. We want to make that very clear so scribes would remove the name Yeshua, Jesus in Greek, from later manuscripts of Matthew's gospel. So this was a belief of the Jews that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem and that he's untouchable. You can't touch him, right? Uh, so there's a very interesting proof text, and this is what the Quran says as well. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the hadith said that Isa was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. How does that go with the Quran? Yeah, I mean, according to the tafsir, so um, the first <clears throat> level of Quranic tafsir is tafsir bin riwaya. So you you would you would make uh, exegesis of the Quran with by looking at other parts of the Quran, and then you look at hadith. So when Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Wa dhuqur fil kitabi Maryam," remember in the book the story of Mary, how she went to a remote place. They'll say she went. She was in Bethlehem at the time. What she was doing in Bethlehem, Allahu alam. Allah subhanahu wa taala placed her in Bethlehem for some reason, and that's where she gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. But it appears that Isa alayhi salam was raised in a northern city called Galilee, uh, or the province of Galilee in a city called Nazareth. Um, so uh, that's according to the tafsir that, she, that, that he was born in Bethlehem, and the hadith mentions that as well. But there's no Joseph the carpenter. There's no stable. Like, like, you know, it says, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, I mean, Mark and John, they don't mention a nativity narrative, right? Jesus, is, he's 30 years old and he's preaching, right? <laughs> Except for that short prologue in John's Gospel, the prologue of the Logos. Uh, uh, but the Quran mentions the Mawlid of Isa alayhi salam at least twice in the Quran is mentioned. Uh, so where does this character of Joseph the carpenter come from? This is another uh, way that Christian authors have tried to tie in Isa alayhi salam with the concept of the Jewish Messiah. So the Jews, they believed based on writings um, like the one I quoted, Micah chapter 5 verse 2, that from Bethlehem, from the towns of Judah, the birthplace of David, will come a king who shall shepherd my people, people Israel. Now the Jews, they would say, well that means that the Messiah is a descendant of David. He's a descendant of David. He's a descendant of Judah. Judah is one of the sons of Jacob. So Isa alayhi salam, <clears throat> if you look at his lineage, it does not go back to David, right? So Joseph the carpenter had to be invented in order for Jesus to sort of have this lineage back to David. So Matthew and Luke, they give genealogies of Jesus. These are the, these are the genealogies, the generations of Jesus. They say Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah, Judah begot all the way down to Joseph the carpenter. But Joseph the carpenter is not the biological father of Isa alayhi salam, right? So how does he tie in with the lineage of David? Because Mary is not from David. Mary is Uchta Harun. Mary is a Levite, right? And this is what the Gospel of, of Luke says also, that Mary was from the uh, daughters of Aaron, and, her, and she was the cousin of Elizabeth, who was a Levite. Uh, so, in order to connect Jesus with this Davidic line, right, um, they would invent this, the Gospel authors uh, would say that uh, his, his stepfather, stepfather was Joseph the Carpenter, this man named Joseph the Carpenter. But he's not mentioned in the Quran. Um, now, what's also interesting about this is that according to Jewish law, the, the tribal distinction or the nesab of the child uh, is taken from the mother and all of the tribes except for the tribe of Levi. Okay? So you are what your mother is. Which, whatever tribe your mother is, that's what you are. Except Levi. So Mary's a Levite and she's not actually allowed to marry outside of her tribe and marry like a Judite or something or Benjaminite. Right? So 
the son of Mary will, will basically have the tribal distinction of his father. Only then can you call him an Israelite. Right? So what that means is that Isa alayhi salam then cannot be from the Bani Israel. Right? He's not from Bani Israel. The Quran makes it very clear. Rasulan ila Bani Israel. Ya Bani Israel. So in the Quran, every prophet refers to their people by saying, Ya qawmi, which means, Oh my people. Right? What does it mean for a people to be your qawm? That means your father is from the people. If your father is from that people, then you can say, Ya qawmi. But Isa alayhi salam never says, Ya qawmi. Ya Bani Israel. O oh, children of Israel. And the wisdom behind that, according to the ulama, is that Isa alayhi salam is actually in the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That he's a Sahabi of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because what is a Sahabi? Let me. I'll get to your question in a minute. What is a Sahabi? According to the definition of the theologians, is that someone who was alive at the time the Prophet laid his blessed gaze upon them. Not they looked at the Prophet. The Prophet looked at them because there were Sahaba who were blind. The Prophet looked at them while they were both alive, and he had faith at the time, and he died upon faith. Right? So Isa alayhi salam, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ was not killed nor crucified. Right? So he was alive. We believe he's now in occultation. He's been raptured, if you will, and he'll come at the end of time. But he did not suffer a mortal death, not yet. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِكَةُ الْمَوْتِ Everyone will die eventually. Isa alayhi salam will die eventually when he comes. We believe in the second coming. But he was alive. The Prophet وسلم, saw him on the night of Laylatul Isra and Mi'raj. And Isa is a prophet. So he has, is, is obvious, he has faith in the Prophet. So Imam Suyuti says, you know, when we talk about who is the greatest Sahabi, some people say, most Muslims will say Abu Bakr Siddiq, some Muslims say Sayyidina Ali. He says, consider Isa salam, who is a Sahabi of the Prophet. Who comes at the end of time and confirms the message of the Prophet? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, the question? Yeah. Yes, Imran. Yeah, so Im Imran is a. Uh, is that your question? Okay, so Imran, according to the book of Exodus, uh, was the name of the father of Moses and Aaron. His name was Amran. Now, some of the Muslim exegetes will say that Mary's, her father, is, was also named Imran. Allahu alam. But it seems like from the verse, Ya Ukhta Harun, when they say Ya Ukhta Harun, they're reminding her of her priestly lineage. Some, some Christian polemicists will say that the Prophet, وسلم, he got two people confused when he wrote the Quran. Right? A'udhu Billah. Because in the, in the Torah, the sister of Aaron is called Miriam. Or Maryam. So he's saying, oh, he, he's, he's got his chronologies confused here, right? Because, ya, ya ukhta Harun, oh sister of Aaron. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, is not the sister of Aaron. He's obviously, he got something wrong here. But that's not necessarily what it means. She, she could have had a brother named Aaron as well. Very common name. She's a Levite. She's a priestly a woman. And it's a very common name. Maryam and Aaron are very common names. Harun, right? Uh, but many commentators will say that this is not this does not mean that her literal brother is Harun, but she's from the lineage of Harun. But is it, is it, is it Harun uh, um, no, Elizabeth. Aaron, 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 Aaron. No, no, Elizabeth is a contemporary of Maryam alayhi salam. So Elizabeth is the wife of Zachariah. So uh, the mother of Yahya alayhi salam. Right. Yeah. So this was yeah. this was many. This is about fourteen hundred years after Harun alayhi salam. Harun alayhi salam was the brother of Musa alayhi salam. So he probably died around thirteen hundred before the Common Era. Right. Um, so um, what was the point I was going to make? Yeah. I mean, it's 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 uh it's very interesting because the Christian Orientalists or the the Christian polemicist, when he comes to the Quran, there tends to be a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? In other words, the prophet is a forger until we can prove that he wasn't. But when it comes to the New Testament and Isa alayhi salam, you know, it's, it's a hermeneutic of acceptance. We accept him until we can prove him wrong. It's exactly the opposite. And many of that, I think, is motivated by racism. 
to give you an idea, I can say the same thing. I can say, well, in the New Testament, when Isa is extracting demons from people, the demons fall down and they say, have mercy on me, son of David. And I can say, well, he's not the son of David. His father's name was Joseph, according to you, or Mary. And the Christian response is, no, no, no. That's, that's you know, it's, it's his forefather. Well, Harun is, his, is her forefather. Ya Ukhta Harun is reminding her of her forefather's lineage. So there's a hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, another example of this is, uh, like, if you listen to, like, um, you know, early Christian debates, there was a Christian scholar named Justin Martyr, and he wrote this book called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. It's very, very interesting. But one of the things that are mentioned in these early debates between Christians and Jews before Islam, because both of them accuse each other of tahrif, you're changing scripture, right? The Jew would say to the Christian, and then the Christian says, no, you guys were changing scripture to hide things. You're motivated what's, by what's known as odium Christi, the, hate, the hatred of Christ. So, your intention, so they're accusing each other of tahrif. And then when the Quran came and said, both of you are making tahrif, they suddenly said, no, you know, we're cool, and the Muslims are wrong. And so it's, there, was a, there was an alliance by, by that time. But one of the things that, that is mentioned in the debate is the Christian will say to the Jew, why don't you accept Isa as the Messiah? And the Jew will say, you know, why should we accept him? And the Christian will say, look, it says in the book of Zechariah that the king of Zion rides upon a donkey, humble upon a donkey, right? And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all say that when Isa was coming into Jerusalem to declare himself the Messiah, he told his disciples, bring me a donkey. All right? So he rode a donkey. And then the Jew will say what? He'll say, oh, yeah, he, he knew about that. So he told his disciples, bring me a donkey because I want to self-fulfill this prophecy. So that's called a hermeneutic of suspicion. Right? So exactly um, what... Uh, the uh, Bani Israel are going to do to some Christian elements, now the Christians are doing to the Muslims, right, and say, oh, the Prophet is inventing these things, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, we have to study these things much more closely. So, the Jewish concept of the Messiah, then, is a political leader, a spiritual leader, one who is not touched. There's a very interesting prophecy in the book of Psalms, which was ascribed to Dawood, alayhi salam. So he writes, you know, and Christians will point to different passages in the Old Testament that seem to indicate uh, the crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam. Uh, I would say, however, they're very ambiguous, very cryptic. The title Messiah is never used in any of these passages. Um, most, most Jews will say that these are actually um, uh, analogies or descriptions of the suffering of the Jewish people, uh, that they have nothing to do with the Messiah. But a Christian hermeneutic of the Old Testament will say these are actually typologies of what happened to Isa in, in an esoteric type of way. So there's two ways of looking at scripture. There's an exoteric way, which takes a literal apparent meaning. And then you have the esoteric way, which takes a mystical meaning. So um, uh, this, uh, this, this mystical meaning could be a foreshadowing of an event to come in the future. Right? So... Interestingly, there is a passage in Psalms where the, the Messiah is mentioned explicitly. So David writes in Psalm 20, verse 6. He says, in Hebrew, he says, He says, I know that God saves his Messiah. Right? God saves his Messiah. Now, it's very interesting about this statement is that the name of Isa alayhi salam, and we don't really know what the name of Isa alayhi salam really was. There's, there's always been difference of opinion, because if you look in the, the Talmud, which is kind of the official position of Judaism regarding Isa alayhi salam, obviously he's not going to be mentioned in um, uh, you know, the oral law, so we'd have to do a little background. So on Sinai, uh, Jews believe that Musa alayhi salam received the Torah, right, the written law, and also the oral law. And the oral law wasn't written down until about the first century, which became the Mishnah. And then up to the sixth century, you have what's known as rabbinical, rabbinical Judaism, where the rabbis would comment on the oral law, right, and this is called the Gemara, and there's a Babylonian version and a Palestinian version. 
So Isa alayhi salam is mentioned in the Babylonian Gemara. And the Gemara and the Mishnah make up the Talmud. Talmud comes from the Arabic Tilmid, the little student of the Torah, right? So in the Talmud, Isa alayhi salam uh, is called by the name Yeshu, without the Ain. Now scholars have wondered why did they take the Ain off the name Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and some say this is a way of defaming him by changing his name. Right? Wallahu alam. Um, but uh, this became problematic, especially in Christian Europe and France, when many of the Jews actually converted to Christianity and then they would expose their former co religionists by saying, Don't you Christians know that this is Jesus? And it's saying these things. And I won't repeat what the Talmud actually says about Isa alayhi salam. Um, because it's some ajib and gharib type of insult that I don't want to reproduce. Uh, but after that happened, the Pope basically said, well, we have to burn every Talmud in France so that they would have these huge bonfires. Well, Jewish literature was thrown into these fires and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it seems like the dominant opinion is that Isa salam's original name was Yeshua or Yeshua or Yeshua. It's an aspiration. And if the latter is correct, this is on a form of a passive participle. So a passive participle means um, a noun uh, that an action is done to, the victim of a verb, right? So, <clears throat> for example, if I say, um, I touched the cat, right? So I is the subject, right? Touched is the verb, and cat becomes the object, right? It's the victim of the action. So if we make that into a passive participle, for example, the name Muhammad, Muhammad is a passive participle, right? So there's a difference between Muhammad and Muhammad. I don't know anyone named Muhammad, but that's actually, it has a meaning. That's an active participle. The one who is praising is called Muhammad. The one who is praised, who's taking the praise, right, is called Muhammad, right? So the, the name of the Prophet وسلم, is also a passive participle, meaning the one who is constantly praised, because this is also on the second verbal form, the fa'ala form, which indicates intensive action, intensively being praised. So then if, if Yeshua is the name of Isa, it's on, the, it's on the scale or on the form of a passive participle. So now we have to investigate what is the root meaning of Yeshua. And the root meaning is, it's a triliteral root, like all Semitic, most Semitic names. The root is Yasha, which means to save someone. To save someone. So then what would be the passive of to save? Is the saved one. The saved. Not active as in save your, right? But the saved one. So interestingly, his name means the saved one. If his name is Yeshua, it means the one who is saved. And... There's actually a clue, or there's a typology of this in this psalm that I quoted, 26. I know that God actively saves his Messiah. He shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. That's what the psalm says. Now, for the longest time, uh, Christians would say that the only religion that made this claim that Isa a.s. was not crucified uh, were the Muslims, right? And initially, the, the Muslims were seen, were seen as this heretical group of Christians. So like in Dante's Divine Comedy, right? Uh, he puts the Prophet a.s. you know, in, in Jahannam, a'udhu billah, and he says, this is a schismatic. He doesn't say this is a founder of a deviant religion. He said, this is a Christian deviant. So that's initially how they, the Muslims were seen. So. For the longest time, 1,200 years, 1,300 years, the only religion that made this claim that Isa alayhi salam wasn't crucified were the Muslims. And then 1945, they found this huge corpus of literature called the Nag Hammadi Library. And in this library, they found documents written by Christians that predate Islam. And they found documents like the Second Treatise of the Great Seth, the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter, and many other writings that actually categorically denied the crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam. So the concept of Isa alayhi salam, the concept of the Messiah not being crucified in the Islamic tradition is more in line with Jewish messianic expectations than the Christian idea of the Messiah. 
the Christian idea of the Messiah is radically different than what the Jews were expecting. Right? So, um, to give you an example, um, the idea that the Messiah is not only the Messiah, but he's a divine incarnation, right? Uh, a divine avatar. So God comes down and dwells within the temporal world. This is called hulul, or tajassud in Arabic, divine incarnation. This is totally blasphemous from a Jewish perspective, right? Because Jewish theology is very clear, and it's very similar to our theology. The first three commandments, right, it's very, very clear that uh, you shall not make unto thyself any graven image of the likeness of anything in the heavens above or of the earth or beneath the sea, for there's nothing like unto God, right? So if you read Deutero Isaiah, for example, it's very, very clear, this type of theology, that basically the message is whenever we bring God within the temporal world, we make an idol out of God. God does not reside in the temporal world. God transcends space, time, and direction, right? So many of the Jews that came after uh, the, um, the conversion of Constantine and kind of inherited uh, this type of theology from the Christian, we can't blame them for rejecting Isa de Salaam, really, because what they actually heard about Isa de Salaam was that he was a divine incarnation, right? And that's completely anathema. I mean, that's, that's unacceptable. So the Torah says, Lo ish el, in one place. In the, uh, in the book of uh, First Kings, it says, uh, ki, uh, uh, ki ana Adonai velo ish, that I am the Lord and not a man. God is not a man, right? It's very, very clear. So uh, this is another aspect uh, that was rejected by the Jews. Also, this idea that Isa salam, and this comes primarily from the teachings of Paul, that Isa salam is a sacrificial lamb, that he vicariously atones for the sins of humanity. This type of idea as well. Muslims would say, and Jews would say, uh, has nothing to do with Abrahamic teaching. That this was something that was taken from outside elements, uh, from, from uh, Paul's missionary uh, work, and was eventually incorporated in Christianity because the book of Ezekiel is very, very clear in many other places in Deuteronomy that every man is put to death for his own sin. <clears throat> so, to summarize the Jewish concept of the Messiah is that the, or the, Jewish, the Jewish belief about Esai de Salaam is that he was, I guess the most congenial opinion you'll get was that he was a very great rabbi Right? who came to think of himself as being some sort of son of God in the metaphorical sense. And at one point, possibly, he claimed to be the Messiah and he was executed by the Romans. Right? And then they, they basically made up a story about uh, his tomb being empty. This is from a Jewish perspective. Possibly his disciples took the body or it was just a myth that was borrowed from uh, ancient uh, Greek mythos. Um, that was recycled and applied to Isa de Sada. Um, so, yes? Um, I have two questions. Yeah, the yeah. first one is, uh, during the time of the prophets of the Lord's Son, uh, and before his prophethood, the people who were known as uh, Hanifa, mm -hmm. were, they, were they Christians who believed in Tawi, or who were they? Was... Yeah, so the, the Hunafa, these were, <clears throat> these were monotheists. They weren't Christians and they weren't Jews. They were basically, um, they claimed to be in the tradition of Ibrahim in the tradition of Abraham. So um, exactly what they, what they believed, what their positions were regarding, for example, the Old Testament, the New Testament is unclear. But we would say that the Prophet Muhammad he was a Hanif before he received the Bi'tha. Uh, before he received the Quran, that he never worshipped idols, because the reputation of a prophet is very, very important, right? Um, so before uh, before he was commissioned as a Rasul, he was known as a Sadiq al Amin. And what's also interesting is that early Christian, early Muslim historians like Ibn Ishaq and Ibn uh, Hisham and at Tabari. They mention very interesting things about the year of the birth of the Prophet. They mention that 
in the in the year that he was born, which is about 570 of the Common Era, it's called the Amul Fi, that there were five children born that year named Muhammad, and that it was never known as a name before that year. There's no record of any child having the name Muhammad in all of history, and and the Arabs were masters of Sanad. They would, and this is, it's one of the beautiful aspects of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared them for this whole science of hadith and Quran memorization, mm -hmm. that they would actually memorize not only their own lineages, but the lineages of their horses, like back several generations. And they had amazing memories, and they were very gifted in, in poetry, right? Again, facilitating them for the message of the Prophet wasallam. But they mentioned that in this year, four children were born in Yathrib named Muhammad, and one in Mecca. And the four that were born in Yathrib were born to Jewish parents. So their conclusion is that somebody knew something from the Bani Israel that a prophet would be born, they even knew his name, right? And they also mention uh, that uh, when the Prophet وسلم, just before he was commissioned as a prophet, that the Arabs in Medina, which was known as Yathrib, who were idolaters at the time, uh, they were always threatened by the Jews in Medina. The Jews would come to them and say, because the Aus and the Khazraj, which became the Ansar, they were always fighting each other. They fought three civil wars. And uh, so the Jews were monotheists living in, in Yathrib, which you know begs the question, what are they doing in Yathrib? Why not, I mean, what, amongst these pagans and, and these people were fighting and so on and so forth. Uh, but they would always tell the Arabs that a prophet is coming here who's going to punish you for your idolatry, right? So they would actually give Bushra to the, Bani, so to the, to the Arabs that the prophet would come. Um, so, it's a... Uh, so I actually have three questions. So, <laughs> so Waraka, Waraka, we'll, we'll see, was he uh, I mean, the cousin of... Uh, Waraka was a Christian. He was a Christian. He was a Christian, he was a Christian scribe, yeah. Okay. But the, the dominant opinion is that he died upon Islam because of his statement to the Prophet وسلم, where he basically confessed his belief in the messengership of the Prophet وسلم. We don't really know what kind of Christian he was, uh, but he did say that, yeah, he said, Musa. So he said, there has come unto you the great law of God. So namus in Arabic is from the Greek nomos, and nomos is what the Septuagint calls the Torah. So there's something similar coming to you that came to Musa, which is also a fulfillment of a prophecy in Deuteronomy, the prophet like unto Moses, right? That, that Musa, alayhi salam, prophesies as a prophet is coming, from our brethren who's going to be similar to me. So Waraka actually identifies the Prophet by saying that this is the same type of sacred law that is coming to you. And then he says that he actually knows, he says that these people are going to persecute you and eventually expel you from the city. And uh, I wish I was alive to defend you then. Now Christian polemicists and Western Orientalists, they try to account for the revelations of the Prophet because he wasn't a sha'ir, he wasn't known to recite poetry. But the early Meccan surahs are so lyrically beautiful that he must have some teacher, right? So they say it was Waraka bin Nofal who was teaching him, right? But the thing is, Waraka bin Nofal died the very next year, right? So you have 12 years that are unaccounted for. And they say, okay, in, in Medina, there was a Jewish rabbi named Abdullah ibn Salam. He was his teacher in Medina. But Abdullah ibn Salam didn't actually become Muslim until two years prior to the Prophet's death, right? So this is what I'm talking about when I say a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? The Prophet is out and out a forger before we can, before anything. Just uh, case closed, you have to prove to me, and they're not being objective, right? Um, but there must be deeper study into this, into the, yeah? I have a question. As far as the conspiracy between Ishmael and Isaac, in the Old Testament. Yeah. Is there anything you're understanding about that? Yeah. So what's interesting about that is uh, there was a great rabbi who basically founded the science of tafsir of the Torah. Uh, his name was Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki uh, or Rashi. They have these acronyms. Like Maimonides is Rambam. Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki who is uh, Sheikh Suleiman Ishaqi, right? 
like Imam, like Maimonides was from Spain. He's also called Imam al Qurtubi, right? That's, that's what the Jews used to call him. So there's two Qurtubi, Sheikh Qurtubi. Um, but he actually gives the fuller dialogue of this event of Genesis 22. So if you read Genesis 22, it says, God says to Abraham, take your son, uh, your only son, the one whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a burnt offering to the Lord. So it seems like from a literal reading, reading of this passage that Isaac is not only the only son of Abraham, one would argue then, no, it, it doesn't say that. It says he's the only son that Abraham loved. So now the insinuation is that Abraham did not love Ismail, right? And people still make this argument. You go to the bookstore today and you find all this literature about Ismail, and they say, oh, his, his name really means this and that, and, and all, all of these crazy things <clears throat> denigrating. It's, it, again, it's motivated by this underlying sense of prejudice and racism against Arabs and Muslims. Um, but Rashi, again, one of the founders of Tafsir of the Torah, he gives the full dialogue of that exchange between Abraham and God. This is totally orthodox Judaism. He's not some nut on the fringe or something. He's like the Al-Ghazali of Islam. He's like the um, Imam Suyuti of Islam uh, um, and many other scholars. So he says that God said to Abraham, sacrifice your son. And Abraham says, which son? And he says, your only son. And Abraham says, this is the only son of his mother, and this is the only son of his mother. And then God says, the one whom you love. And then Abraham says, I love both of them. And then he says, Isaac. Right? So this is the tafsir of this ayah. That Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to Rashi, one of the most authoritative Torah commentators to ever live, that Ibrahim alayhi salam loved Ismail alayhi salam. Right? Now, however, the story in the Torah uh, has problematic aspects to it. Like, for example, it says that uh, they were banished into the desert because Ismail was playing with Isaac on the day of Isaac's weaning. When is a child weaned in Jewish law? At three years old. However, the problem here is, according to the Torah, Ibrahim salam was 86 years old when Ismail was born and 100 years old when Ishaq was born. In fact, the name Ishaq uh, means laughter in Hebrew. The exact cognate in Arabic is Idhaq, from Dhaqika, right? Why is he called laughter? Because the Quran says, when, and also the Torah says, when the angels came to them and said, you're going to have a son, Sarah did what? Fadhaqat, she laughed. Ata'ajabina min amrillah, do you marvel at the, the order of God? So they named their son, Laughter. Ishaq, Yitzchak means laughter, right? So, um, so this would have made Ismail 17 years old at the time of Isaac's weaning, right? Because 14 years old, he, when Ismail was 14, Isaac was born. Now it's the day of Isaac's weaning. That means Ismail is 17 years old. He's a grown man. 17 year old man back then is a grown man, right? So, however, we're given the profile of an infant here. What does it say? Banish this woman and her son, and Abraham takes some a knapsack and the son and puts them on her shoulder. She's carrying the son into the wilderness. He starts crying. She puts him down under a shrub. He starts kicking his feet. She picks him up, lift him up in your hand. I will make of him a great nation. So the chronologies here don't line up, right? It, 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 there's something wrong here. Right? Because Ismail Islam would have been 17 years old at the time. Now, Muslims, the, the story as it's told in the Quran is very interesting because Ismail is not even identified in the Quran. This story is, is told in the 37th surah called Surah Al Safa. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say this is Ismail. Now, Imam Suyuti and many others say the verses indicate Ismail, and that's the dominant opinion. But big Sahaba said, this, this is Ishaq. That's an opinion of big Sahaba. Imam Ali had this opinion that the child that Ibrahim was going to sacrifice was Ishaq. Because it's not a big issue for the Muslim. It's not that big of an issue. Because the lesson of the story is the most important thing. That Ibrahim salam was willing to sacrifice the most beloved thing to him, to, the most beloved object to him. Even more beloved than himself is his son. It's the hardest thing to do, right? 
Uh, so that's what the Muslim takes from the story. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he just says, فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ We gave him glad tidings of a forbearing son. And then he tells a story. And then he says, وَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِإِسْحَاقَ نَبِيًا مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And then we gave him, and it, and it depends on how you take this fa. Is it, is it so, or is it and? Is it indicating the story before, or is it a new son? So there's difference of opinion as to how you take this conjunction. But the dominant opinion is that the son to be sacrificed is Ismail, also based on the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and Ibn al-Dibhayn, I am the son of the two sacrifices. So when Ismail was ransomed, a ram was sacrificed, a celestial ram brought by Jibreel salam, and also uh, his father Abdullah was ransomed for 100 nuq or she camels because his grandfather had made an oath if I have 10 sons, I'm going to kill one of them. Right? So we know that story as well. But it's a major issue for Bani Israel that it is Ishaq because um, it, for nationalistic uh, considerations. And it's also a big deal for the Christian that it's Ishaq because Isa is a descendant of Ishaq. And this is, again, an esoteric foreshadowing of God killing his own son. Right? Abraham killing his son, putting wood on his son's back leading him to the slaughter, right? binding his son, um, this type of thing. Of course, the son was saved. The Muslim will say, maybe that's true, but he was saved at the end, and Isa was saved at the end as well. Well, that's a long answer, answer to your question. I appreciate it. No. Well, just open it up for questions and comments. Yes. Oh, Salam alaikum. How are you? Um, <clears throat> well, the, the Catholic position is that, the question is, uh, uh, was Joseph married to Mary, um, um, and why is he not the father of Jesus? So the, the, the Catholics have a doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity, so um, it, it's seen as something, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is motivated by... Um, sort of this, uh, I don't know how to put this exactly, but uh, this kind of low view of women, I think. Um, that, the, that the sexual act is something that uh, is seen as, um, you know, something that is kind of just given as a dispensation and not the natural state of things. So the highest ideal amongst the early church fathers is celibacy. Right. Paul says, for example, in his letters, it is better for a man not to touch a woman. Right? Uh, in the book of Revelation, it says that 144,000 Israelites will go to paradise, 12,000 from each tribe, undefiled by women. Right? This type of thing. So a lot of the early Christian writers, uh, not all of them, but many of them, especially people like Tertullian of Carthage, were total misogynists. I mean, you read Tertullian, you know, it's Eve's fault, she's soulless. Uh, she's the, the reason for the downfall and so on and so forth and, uh, and basically puts all the blame on Eve and Paul has similar statements about Eve as well so this idea of being free from the contact of women uh, was seen as a very high ideal so the Catholics believe to this day that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life um, the, uh, the Protestant um, uh, has no problem with that, but also has no problem with taking the position that later on she might have been married, right? Because Isa alayhi salam, according to the New Testament, had an extended family. He had brothers and sisters. Now, these could have been brothers and sisters that she had with Joseph uh, after she had Isa alayhi salam from a miracle. Um, but, you know, it's kind of an open question for Protestants. But for Catholics, it's very important. Now, the reason the Muslims believe in the virgin birth is because it's expressly mentioned in the Qur'an, right? And that's the only reason why. And the wisdom behind that, according to the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to manifest His power uh, by performing a special miracle as a sign of Isa alayhi salam's nabuwa. And that's all it is. So, Adam alayhi salam, so the Qur'an says, إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ Adam." That the similitude of Isa is like that of Adam, خَلَقَهُ مِن تُرَابٍ 
We created from dust. Thumma, he created him from dust. Thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. And then he said to him, be, and there he was. It's a mu'jizah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he breaks cause and effect or natural law, the hukum adi, in order to demonstrate his power. Now, why is, I mean, Paul in Romans, Paul in Romans actually doesn't know anything about the virgin birth, right? Paul actually says that Jesus is of the seed of David according to the flesh. Uh, so he doesn't mention the virgin birth. But the Gospels, at least Matthew, uh, 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 Matthew and Luke, are clear that Mary was a virgin. Um, so this was something that was uh, problematic for early Christians to, in order to reconcile. Uh, but Jesus also had to be, according to, like I said, the early, the previous Jewish conceptions of the Messiah, a descendant of David. So how do you reconcile a virgin birth from a Levite woman and at the same time he has to be from David? So this became very problematic. It's still a conundrum to this day, is how do you trace Jesus to David? Now what's also interesting is the Essene community at Qumran, they believed in the dual Messiah, and some Jews believe in the dual Messiah, and the Essenes were Jews, obviously, that there's two Messiahs. There's a priestly Messiah, and there's a kingly Messiah. A Messiah from David, and a Messiah from Aaron, which is another very interesting thing to look into. Of course, they found this a uh, copy of, it seems like it's Barnabas' Gospel. Have you heard about this recently? And I think they found it in Turkey. It's written in Aramaic and like in a gold book or something where it says um, that Isa al prophesizes the prophet by name, right? And it's dated about 400 years prior to the oldest versions of Barnabas' Gospel that we have. Well, what's interesting is that Isa al in this document says that the Messiah is not from uh, David. He's the son of Ishmael and that he identifies the Prophet Sallallahu as being the Messiah. Now, if we look at that literally or from an outward, superficial perspective, the Muslim will say, well, this is counter to the Qur'an, because the Qur'an says that Isa is the Messiah. Uh, unless, unless somebody takes it in the sense that there's a dual Messiah, a kingly Messiah and a priestly Messiah, which is possible. But Allahu A'lam. Um, I hope I answered the question. Okay. Yes. So, so Joseph, he, he, he was an actual person. I thought you said he, he was made up by the Christians. He's probably he's probably invented. I mean that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, uh, because um, again, to keep in line with Jewish ex Jewish expectations of the Messiah being from the son of David, and Jesus very clearly is a Levite from Mary. Um, how do you tie him into David's lineage? It's that you say that Mary was betrothed to Joseph, who is from David, and that somehow, mystically, Jesus inherits the Davidic line from his stepfather. Um, what's also very interesting is, uh, according to Catholic and Eastern Orthodox tradition, Joseph was in his 90s at the time uh, when he married Marianne, who was 11 or 12. So he had grandchildren older than his wife. Right? And, it's, and that was basically the the average age of marriage for a girl at the time was 11 or 12 years old in Palestine 2,000 years ago. Um, so it wasn't seen as scandalous or anything like that. Uh, of course, in our, according to our postmodern sensibilities, we say, oh, this is, you know, whatever. But there's aspects of our lives today that ancient peoples will say, this, this is just animalistic behavior. So it goes both ways, I think. I think in ancient, you mentioned James. His successor of Jesus. Mm. I believe the book says that he was his brother. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, James is the brother of Jesus. Yeah. He's also his successor. Um, so that's that's the thing is how is how is uh and what is the nature of James being the brother of Jesus? Does it mean brother in the sense that he's just his Muslim brother, so to speak? Or is it is he the son of Mary from Joseph that was born after? Um, or is he actually one of the sons of Joseph and not Mary, and Mary did not uh, have intercourse for her, the rest of her life? So Christians have wrestled with this issue. What is the nature of James being the brother of Jesus? What does that mean? So it's, a, it's an open question. But definitely the book of Acts tells us that James was the successor of Jesus. He is the leader of the Jerusalem apostles, and according to the 
commentaries of the book of Galatians, the apostles that come into Galatia to correct Paul's deviant teachings were sent by James from Jerusalem. So very early on, this is like in the 40s of the common era, before any gospel that's in the Bible was written, there is a clear uh, difference of opinion that's fundamental between uh, people that Paul is evangelizing and the, uh, the teachings of James out of Jerusalem. I didn't understand the question. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't. They didn't draw lots. It was a custom of the Romans to release a Jewish prisoner uh, before the Passover, <clears throat> as a sh as a show of goodwill. So they bring out the prisoners and say, "Which one of these men do you want to us to release to you?" Uh, so most of the men were insurrectionists. Right? They were mujahideen who tried to fight against the Romans. Um, so from the gospel accounts, they cried for Barabbas to be freed, and they crucified Isa and Isa. But again, the variant reading in Matthew says that they're both named Jesus, so it adds a level of ambiguity as to which Jesus was released, which Jesus was actually crucified. The drawing of the lots comes uh, with the guardianship of Mary. And this is mentioned in the Quran, and it's also mentioned in what's known as the Proto-Gospel of James, which is not in the New Testament. So the second century gospel called the Proto-Gospel of James, which actually uh, has many stories that are confirmed in the Quran. Uh, like the casting of the lots to take care of Mary, uh, angels feeding Mary in the temple, like it's mentioned in the Quran, Zakaria who was her custodian, comes into the temple and he sees, and Imam at tabari says it was fruit out of season. So he says, ya, he says, ya Mary, anna laki where, where did you get this? This is from God, right? This story is from the Gospel of James. That could be the source of the story. Now the thing is that a Christian might say, "Well, James's gospel is apocryphal. It's, it's, it's not even in the it's not even in the New Testament." Uh, but you have to remember that this this gospel was written in the second century, and the gospel did not become canonized and closed until the Council of Trent in the 15th century. So, 1,300 years later, in the Catholic tradition, was the canon finally closed. So, that's the whole question: is what is heterodox and orthodox Christianity in the first three centuries. Nobody knows. There's a great book written by F.C. Bauer called Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy in Earliest Christianity in which he tries to prove that what we know today as being Trinitarian Orthodox Christianity was by no means the dominant opinion of the Christians in the first three centuries. In fact, after the Council of Nicaea, when Jesus was made God by vote, by 360, the vast majority of bishops had uh, Aaron, Aaronist or Ebionite Christology. They believed that Isa was not God. The vast majority of the bishops, by 360, did not believe Isa was God. Even after Nicaea, when it was put to vote. Yeah. I have two questions. One uh, was, is that, is that regarding the Gospel of James, and what that had meant for Christians, uh, are there problematic things as far as the Orthodox doctrine? And then, secondly, was I've heard uh, kind of historians talk or argue that maybe the Ebionites, um, who basically believe, had very similar to kind of Muslim beliefs, that they believe in the prophet, they follow Moses, they follow that because they were so kind of persecuted uh, by Pauline Christianity or Constantine Christianity that they were kind of pushed or maybe they fleed into the Arabian Peninsula. And perhaps there was some interaction or influence or around the time of Constantine. Yes, good question. So dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, as far as we can tell, are not Christian documents. So they were written before 
uh, the Christian era or contemporary with uh, early Christian writings. Uh, basically, the Dead Sea Scrolls was authored by a, a group of monastic Jews called the Essenes, and it's basically the entire Old Testament and a few other documents known as the community rule. Uh, and then there's some kind of eschatological, very cosmic writings. It's kind of cryptic about a teacher of right righteousness, a wicked priest. And some Christians will say, well, the teacher of righteousness is, is Jesus, and the wicked priest might be Paul or might be James, or the, the righteous teacher might be James. But that's all conjecture. As far as we can tell, uh, these are Jewish writings, and, and totally Jewish writings. Um, so what, what does it mean for Christianity? It means that we have uh, manuscripts of the Old Testament, and they're not complete manuscripts, but we have manuscripts of the Old Testament that can be dated to the first century. Because before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest complete version of the Old Testament in existence is called the Masoretic Text, which is dated to 1008 of the Common Era. So you can imagine, the Torah was revealed to Musa and 1400 before the Common Era. The oldest complete version of the Old Testament is 1,000 of the common era. So you have 2,400 years where there's no complete version of the Old Testament in Hebrew, right? Uh, but now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which, um, again, it's not complete, but most of it is there. Uh, as far as the Ebionites fleeing into the Arabian Peninsula, that's certainly possible. I've heard that argument as well from, uh, from critics of Islam that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, might have been influenced by Ebionite elements. What's interesting though is the Christology presented um, in the Quran isn't purely Ebionite. The Quran confirms the virgin birth and as far as we know the Ebionites did not confirm the virgin birth. The Ebionites were adoptionists. They said that Isa was made son of God at the baptism. Uh, but the Quran says he was born from a virgin uh, and that's something that the Ebionites, that's a proto-Orthodox belief. The Ebionites, as far as we can tell also, again, we don't have their writings, but as far as we can tell, they believe that Isa alayhi salam was crucified. Uh, but the Quran says he wasn't crucified. That's actually a Gnostic, quote unquote, Gnostic belief. So where did he get this? So this idea that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, you know, he had, you know the story of Isa alayhi salam uh, making uh, birds out of clay and then breathing on them. This is found in the gospel called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas which was written in the second century, and it's just so highly improbable that the Prophet Sallallahu even most Christians even knew about this gospel in the Arabian Peninsula. There were no Christian or Jewish tribes living in Mecca. We know that for certain. There were individual Christians and Jews that might have passed by, like Waraka was, you know, he was a Christian scribe living in Mecca, but there were no tribes. So this idea that how did the Prophet know of this story if he wrote the Quran? You know, some have said, well, maybe he had a copy of Thomas's Gospel underneath his pillow when he was sleeping. I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense to account for the entire Christology, the elements of the Christology, like saying Isa was, uh, he was a prophet and Messiah, but not God. That's Ibnite Christology. But that's not all the Quran says about Isa A.S. Isa A.S. born under a palm tree speaking as an infant, these come out of seemingly nowhere. There is no source for this. Where does it come from? Right? Where is he getting this from? So, you know, it's kind of, uh, in Western Academy, you have to find a source for something. Like, in, in, even in my, my New Testament Gospels class, we were talking about what is Mark's source of his Gospel? And people are saying, oh, he had, you know, oral tradition, and he might have this and that. And I raised my hand, non-Christian, and I said, maybe Mark was inspired to write it from God. And everyone just gasped. <laughs> How can you say that here? That's something we say in church. <laughs> and here's a Muslim saying this, right? So in Western Academy, there has to be a source. He got it from somewhere, right? So there is a major rift uh, that I notice between Christian laity and the Ulama of Christianity. It's that they don't see eye to eye most of the time. Um, because of issues like this. But the Quran invites this type of criticism. Criticism in the academic way means to analyze something very closely. Allah says, Afala yatadabbaruna al-Quran. Do they not have tadabbur, which means to penetrate something to find the end of it, right? Uh, do they not have this type of deep contemplation 
of the Quran. This is what the Quran invites upon itself, upon itself, which interestingly was exactly the opposite of what we see in Christian Europe when you know it was actually forbidden to have a copy of the Bible in your private possession. It's actually a capital offense. Uh, and many were executed. William Tyndale, who was executed in 1525, not, not that long ago, 1525, he actually, he, was, he never apostated, he was a Christian, but what he did was he translated the Old and New Testaments directly from Greek and Hebrew. And they thought that was just heretical. So he was burned at the stake. And then they had the Reformation, right? Just a few years after him, and then in 1611, less than 100 years after Tyndale, they made the official King James Version based on Tyndale's translation, right? So the poor man was burned at the stake, and then his contribution became the greatest contribution in the history of, of, of American Bible translation, English Bible translation, right? Uh, so, and I think this kind of, this kind of led to what's going on in Europe right now as far as Christendom becoming a land of atheism. I mean, there's some countries in Europe that are 80% atheist, right? Um, you know, you have the Protestant Reformation, and then you have the printing press, so everyone has access to Bibles in their vernacular, and uh, reading the entire Bible, for many Christians, is, is, it becomes problematic. Um, because, you know, before that time, you know, you go to the church, and they recite something like, the letter of Paul or John 3.16 or John 1.1 1, 1. and when you read the stories of the Torah Old Testament uh, it can be very faith shattering and it has been even to now many 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 Christians are leaving Christianity right now millions of them and that's why you have all of these atheists coming out of Europe like you know Dawkins and Hitchens and these guys trying to come to America and say well you know this is what the Bible actually teaches and you guys don't know you guys are you know illiterate Americans and, I'm from Oxford, I know what I'm talking about. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, is there any record of what happened to Barabbas after um, the crucifixion scene? And second, would you talk a little bit more about the scene idea of a priestly messiah and the kingly messiah? Was that like the dual nature within one man? Or... Um, so those are my two questions. Well, as far as Barabbas goes, I don't know if Josephus mentions him. I don't think he does. I know they made a movie about Barabbas starring Anthony Quinn in the 70s. And according to this movie, according to this movie, he was also crucified at the end. But uh, the only one that I can imagine would mention Barabbas would be uh, Josephus um, in the Jewish War. But I don't, I don't remember a, a reference to him. Uh, but I have to check that, so I, I don't know. Uh, as far as the dual messiah, um, it seems like the dominant opinion was that there will be two messiahs, two independent people. Uh, and there's even evidence of this in the Old Testament as well. Uh, a, a messiah from David and a messiah from Aaron, or a Le Levitical messiah and a, a Judite messiah. And it seems like this was a major part of the uh, uh, theology, if you will, of the Christology, Christology of the Essenes, that there would be two messiahs. Uh, would that have been a duality between the political and the spiritual? It's possible, yeah. I've, I've heard that opinion as well. Um, but then the question comes, what, what tribe is he from then? Right? But that, that could be, I mean, they were very cosmic. Uh, the Essenes were very cosmic, very dual um, in their cosmology. So I've heard that as well. The dominant opinion is that they're two independent salvific figures to come. One was basically a manifestation of Jalal attributes, majestic attributes, and one was a manifestation of Jamal or beautiful attributes. So the Prophet he has both of these attributes, right? And Medina, what was manifested from him, because now he's the, you know, Al Farabi would call him the philosopher king of the city. Uh, he's the head of the government, so uh, he has to, to punish people who are breaking the law, but at the same time, he visited a young boy because his bird died. Right? And he felt bad for the boy. So he is the manifestation of Jalali and Jamali attributes as well. And in reality, he is a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no real duality in Islam. Right? Allah, everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that even Satan is 
has respite because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that ability uh, to do what he does. In Jahannam Hellfire, it's just a manifestation of the Jalali or majestic attributes of God. Um, and Jannah is the reflection of the Jamali attributes. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I'd have to do further research. Yes? Okay, so I know that you said to the Muslim who doesn't really matter that much, but I just need to declare. So when you were going back and forth and you were saying that there was a conversation going on between Abraham and about which son. Yeah. What, who was, that conversation was who? And that was uh, the Islamic account or a Christian account or what? Uh, and then he said, then the last thing was said was Isaac. Yeah, that's that's according to Rashi. He's, he's a, a rabbi. He's a medieval rabbi from France. He's basically one of the most famous uh, exegetes of the Torah. And he actually, in commenting on Genesis 22, he gives this full dialogue. Presumably it's from the Talmud, which is the oral law and the opinions of the early rabbis, uh, commenting on... What does it mean for Isaac to be the only son of Abraham, the one whom he loves? So according to Rashi, which is, again, as mainstream Judaism as you can get, the point I was trying to make was that, according to the account, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he loved both children. He didn't hate one and then love the other one. He loved them both. But ultimately, Isaac was the one to be sacrificed. And that's what the Torah says. Um, and there's some Muslims, like I stated, that have that opinion as well. Some of the Sahaba concluded that Ishaq was the one to be sacrificed because Muslims don't make an issue over the identity of the son. It's not a major issue for us. Although the dominant opinion is that it's Ismail based on hadith of the Prophet and Ibn of Pain. I am the son of the two slaughters. Uh, but that's yeah, it's from a Jewish source. Okay, thank you. So we're just gonna have like the last two and then we're gonna wrap up and Oh. So, I guess a lot of Christians who do question the divinity of Jesus and Islam, they do end up becoming Muslim. But are there any contemporary Christian groups who do doubt, I said, like the Trinity, and who do believe that he's a prophet? Or something along the lines? Yeah, I mean, there's Unitarian Christians that are. I mean, I've ne I've, apparently they're still around. I've never met a I've never met a Unitarian Christian in my life, but apparently there's still Unitarians around. It's like a Hanbali. I've never met a Hanbali, but apparently they're still around. <laughs> kind of an enda endangered species. So there are the same famous, I guess, out there. The Unitarians. Are there any other like smaller? Sort yeah, of I mean, the, the Jehovah's Witness, who are not considered Christian by the mainstream Orthodox, they don't believe in the divinity of Christ. They believe he's the Son of God, but they still believe in the. In the inerrancy of the New Testament. They also have their own translation of the New Testament, which is called the New World Translation. They believe Jesus is the Savior, but they would deny that Jesus is the deity. Right? Um, and of course, you have the Mormon position that believes that Jesus is a god amongst a plethora of many, many gods. They're actually polytheistic. Probably the most polytheistic religion in the world is Mormonism. So for that reason, they're rejected by the mainstream as well. But Orthodox Christianity as far as Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestantism will say that Jesus is God, uh, begotten, not made, co-equal, co-substantial, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And that obviously is very problematic to, to the Muslim. Uh, and, you know, we can go into details as to what that actually entails, but it would be beyond the scope of life. But, yeah, apparently they're still around. So. <laughs> The conclusion that I came to just is that with Christianity and, and all of the uh, like the Jewish and the Christian scholars and everything, it's like one big endless argument. Because even when you mention how there's manuscripts and writings of another group's theory or their belief is still not leading to one of the, you know one of the divine sources of revelation to where it seems like they're drawing away a life. Where I look at Islam, when we have the scholars of Islam, it's it's it seems like it, it helped uh, the Muslims 
be a little more organized or they made it easier for us to kind of, um, you know, draw beliefs and actions about how we should live our lives and how we should view a lot and, and view the, like the, the articles of faith and our pillars, you know, like it's all put into perspective right. to where you have Muslims from all over the world who, who have the same exact view of whatever the concept is or whatever the ritual is. Yeah. I mean, you may have variances, you know, of, 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 of a ritual, but basically, yeah. you know, like Tawheed, we have that, or you go to Hajj mm -hmm. and you don't have a bunch of Muslims arguing at the Haram, like, what day do you do, Sa'i? And are you going yeah. to Mena today or tomorrow? You right. know, so it's like at the end of the day, if you just want to have um, a good conversation with a Christian or a Jew about, you know, this and that. Right. Yeah, that's, know, that's the thing about the Hajj you mentioned. Is that they don't? It doesn't get a lot of playtime. I mean, this is a world event, yeah. but very rarely will you see like something on, you know, Nightline or something or they a CNN. Only just, they only just use the word Mecca. No, well, they're right at the That's bottom. The thousand, millions of Muslims, you know, the little script at the bottom. Well, they show like a still shot because it's very, very powerful. The image of—I mean, they've done Hutch, you know, Michael Wolf did a Hutch special a few years ago. Once in a while, they do something, but it's so powerful because there's nothing like this on earth, right? And you're absolutely right. I mean, we can go to a masjid in China and be able to follow a khutbah very, you know, what's going on as far as he's making the adhan, now we're going to bring the sunnah, now we're going to do the sermon, right, so on and so forth. There, interestingly, there are churches in the Middle East, uh, there's, there's actually congregations in Syria that still conduct their liturgy in Aramaic. And if you go to the church, you'll see the Christians standing in rows and praying and making sajda, and they're reciting in Aramaic. You'll think it's a masjid. I saw the Jews. I saw some Jews doing that. Yeah, they, 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 yeah the Samaritans, they, they pray like that as well. Yeah, so it's very interesting. I mean, you take one of those Christians in a Muslim country, and they haven't been influenced by Islam. They were there before Islam. That's This is how they've been taught to pray. They actually believe, like in, in, in Egypt, that St. Mark started that church. And you go to Iraq, and Thaddeus, was, these are disciples of Jesus, right, that predate Islam. If you took one of those Christians from that church and put them into Yankee Stadium at a Joel Osteen Revival, he would have no idea what's going on. <laughs> what are these people talking about? Right? But if you put him in a masjid, he's like, okay, I see what's going on here. There's praying and they're making sajda. I mean, that's, that's because he's inherited something of a sanad, so a transmission from Isa from James, the Jerusalem apostles. We're going to uh, wrap up unless we got any pressing questions <laughs> that we don't answer tonight. Somebody's gonna like a pasta. <laughs> <laughs> so we can just have somebody make the event and then we'll just end with prayer and show them. I'm sorry if I said anything that offended anyone, it's not our intention. Please, please uh, pray for us.